God, we thank you for another opportunity to come into your house to hear your word to your children. And we pray, Lord God, that your heart will again pass through my lips, that I would receive your thoughts to speak, that, oh God, you might receive the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. My subject for this morning is having vision during a dark time. In the book of Habakkuk, small prophet, chapter 1 and verse 1, this is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? <clears throat> but you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch over this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence, I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. The Lord replied, look around at the nations, look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. When you read the prophets in the Old Testament, no matter if it's Isaiah or Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Hagar, all of these prophets, you would think they were talking about our country. You would be thinking that they're referring to the United States of America. You see what's going on. You're aware of what the Bible says in the last days that violent times will come. Dark times are here for many people in our country. We thus far have escaped the darkness. For how long? None of us knows. Amen. We're enjoying what we have at this moment. But reality says to me we can lose it at any time. Amen. Violent gangs taking over cities, towns, theft, robbery, People going into stores and they cannot be stopped. One store lost a million dollars in merchandise. Stores are leaving our big cities. A two-tier justice system. Looks like the bad guys get away with it. <clears throat> and the good guys get persecuted. That's where we're living. So the prophet looked around and he said, well, what are you talking about? And he says, because there's no repentance in Judah and Jerusalem, I will cause the Babylonians to come in and burn down and destroy what you have built. I will cause foreign troops to come on your soil destroy Jerusalem and Judea. Ladies and gentlemen, not to bring along or fear, but do a Google search and you will see that there are foreign troops already on the soil of the United States of America. Right. Mm -hmm. And not only that, physically, but we have been invaded virtually, electronically, and hacked from foreign countries. Their influence has already been set in America. 
buying up tens of thousands of acres of land that belongs to American people. So you say, well, what did the prophet do? Well, the prophet was comforted in a sense because God was going to show him that there was going to come another foreign nation one day and destroy the Babylonians who destroyed Jerusalem and Judea. <coughs> but that was long term, long range. And long range for us, there will be an eternity. And long range for us, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. Long range for us, we win and we are victorious. That's right. Yeah. But what about keeping vision in the dark time? Because we can allow this to consume us. We can allow what they're doing and what they're saying bring such fear upon us that it immobilizes us and paralyzes us even spiritually. So God gave the prophet instruction. And he said in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1, he says, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. Therefore I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. The vision is for a future time. It describes the end and will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. God said the Babylonians aren't coming tomorrow, or even next month, but they'll be here. And it's kind of like the person that plays with God. It's kind of like the person that stays stuck in their sin. And they keep saying to themselves, well, I haven't been judged yet. Another day has gone by. But God warns us. He says, be careful. Be careful in your pride. Be careful in your posture. Be careful in your boasting. Because God comes to his temple suddenly. And when he comes suddenly... So, it's the word. He that continually hardens his neck after he's been reproved, God said, I will suddenly take from the face of the earth. You can't mess with God. You may have created your own theology and your own religion, but if it's anti-Christ and it doesn't go with the word of the Lord, You will be judged. Amen. And so will I. You see, in this day of darkness, we need revelation. Amen. And we need illumination through God's word. I like the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 3, 1, when he was a boy. Then the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli the prophet. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. But the revelation came to Samuel. Because God had anointed him. In Psalm 74 and verse 9, we no longer see your miraculous signs, the people say. All the prophets are gone and no one can tell us what will be in the end. In Psalm 74 9, in another translation, it says, There's not a symbol or a sign of God in sight, nor anyone to speak in his name. No one knows what's going on. That's right. Sounds like our country. Amen. No one knows what's going on. What's going on? They're like deer in a headlight. Right. And we make excuses for them being a deer in a headlight. Amos chapter 8 verse 11 says, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People don't want it. Even Christians who say they're Christians, it's hard to convince them of doctrinal truths. It's hard to convince them this is what God says you need. There's such a rebellion. There's such a pushback. There's such a stubbornness. What choice does God have? 
and to send a famine of his word because people will not listen. In Amos 8 and verse 12 it says, They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. What a terrible day that will be. What a terrible day that will be. When people come to the door of this church and perhaps there's no one here because we're gone. Oh, you say, well, that can't happen. Well, why not? Why not? There is no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled for the second coming of Christ. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 and 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You know what it means to have no vision? In the direct translation, it means to feel naked and ashamed. And when you have no vision in the Lord, and when you don't know Him, you feel naked and you feel ashamed. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God. That's what it means. Where there's no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. But he who keeps the law of God, blessed is he. Amen. You need revelation. Not what your grandma taught you, what some church taught you years ago. We need Jesus. Amen. We need Jesus. We need a fresh coat of blood upon Amen. our soul. Amen. We need Christ. Children need Christ. You need Christ. I need Jesus more now than I did yesterday. Amen. Without godly vision, we perish. Without the regenerated soul through the blood of Christ, we perish. We live for nothing. Vision and cause are interchangeable. John 12 and 27, Jesus came and he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. What shall we say? Save us from this darkness that will come eventually. Shall we say, Lord, take this cup from us? Don't let what happened to Maui happen to us. Don't let what's happening to our brothers and sisters in China and foreign countries who are being tortured. Shall we pray, let that not come to us? Because we in America, as American Christians, we think we're so special. Because we have everything. We have all the accoutrements of life. We have all the prosperity. We have jobs and homes and cars. We have it all. We have become Laodicea in America. We have no need of nothing, we say to the Lord. And God says, don't you know that you're blind, naked, and miserable? Because you have no revelation of the Son of God. Think about that for a moment. People perish because they have no revelation. So we're living in a dark time. And Jesus came with a cause. For this cause came I unto this hour. And that was his reason for living. That was his reason for coming. But what about you and I? What's your cause? Amen. Are we here just to eat, sleep, go to the bathroom, and after so, so many years die? Is that what life's about? Is it about going up the corporate ladder and becoming rich and having a big house and a big car? Is that what it is? Is it notoriety? Is it people patting you on the back and saying, hey, you are great? What is it? What is it that people are looking for? You see, Jesus had a vision of humanity whereby they could be saved from their sins by him going to the cross. But Jesus not only had godly vision, listen carefully, he had godly direction. A lot of people have no direction. I heard a testimony of a lady yesterday whose family was in Afghanistan. 
Such a humble woman of God. Her husband, her children, her entire family were martyred by ISIS. Somehow she survived. And she's telling her story. She misses her husband, her children, her family. But yet she still stands. She still stands in her faith because she has vision. What can I do to help others stand? What can I do to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? I heard a pastor yesterday. He's 33 years old. And he's preaching and he's saying how many people he's known in his family who have died of cancer. He said, this is not a tomb. This is a pacemaker. He says, I just wear out pacemakers. This is my third one. I'm 33 years old. By the time I was 32, I had three heart attacks. You would not know it by the way he was preaching. I said, you would not know it by the way he was preaching. It's like, God's got this. I'm good. I just wear out pacemakers. I'm all right. I don't understand it all. Because God sometimes is mysterious. We do look through a glass darkly. But you know what? There was no feeling sorry for himself. This guy had vision. This guy was looking to the future. He's only 33 years old and he's had three heart attacks. Think about that for a moment. But he was preaching victoriously. He was preaching with hope and he was giving hope to other people through his broadcast. I just had to sit in the parking lot. I was going to go shopping. And I said, I, I can't turn this off. I got to hear this. What, what's the end here? Weapons can wait. Time bread can wait. I said, I got to hear the end of this. I got about 10 minutes. I told my wife last night, I said, think of this. And we had people murmuring, complaining. Mm. I didn't get my hamburger quick enough. <laughs> my fries are a little soggy. My coffee's too strong. What's wrong with us? Amen. What's happened to us? Are we such spoiled brats in America? <laughs> yes. Are we so entitled that we think we should have all of this? And not feel any pain? Wow. Without godly vision, there is no godly direction. You see, Eve had the wrong vision when she looked upon the tree in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Lot had the wrong vision when he pitched his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 13 and 12. David had the wrong vision when he looked upon Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11 and 2. The person with no vision looks backward as Lot's wife did in Genesis 19, 24 through 26. The person with no vision looks at the storm as Peter did in Matthew 14, verses 29 through 30. But the person with vision and direction looks toward Christ as in John 3, verses 14 through 16. Amen. You have to have godly vision coupled with godly direction. You have to know where you're going. Because if you don't prepare in the Lord, you prepare to fail. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. If you don't prepare in Him, all we do is prepare to fail. And then people wake up after so many years and they say, I'm such a failure. Because you didn't have godly vision and you didn't have godly direction. And it's not too late to receive both. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Helen Keller, and you know who she is, said these words. What would be worse than being born blind to have sight and no vision? People have sight, and you ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You ask adults. Huh? What, what do you do when you're like, huh? Golfing? Fishing? On the boat? Oh, man. Wow. Exciting. Exciting. That's it. Anything spiritual. Any revelation. Any vision. Any godly direction. Any regeneration of the soul. Is there a song in your heart Amen. that your mouth can sing? Can you open your mouth? Or are you going to be quiet even in eternity? Are we going to refuse to sing before God? Are we just going to stand here like... Give me silence in heaven for a half an hour and that's it. That's right. Pentecostals take over. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. <laughs> How can you not sing unto the Lord? That's the, what God has brought you through and what he's given you. He woke you up this morning. He caused your heart to beat and blood to flow. Robert Kennedy, during my time, excuse me, let me get there in a moment. Vision is a goal. Vision is a purpose. Successful people are those who are motivated by a dream beyond themselves. Successful people are people who are motivated by a dream beyond themselves. Unsuccessful people are those who are only motivated by today. Short-term satisfaction instead of long-term results. See, that's what people settle for. They settle for short term. Feed me now. Give me now. Feed the beast. Feed self. That's what it's all about. Paul warned Timothy about the days that will come when people will be lovers of their own selves. Greedy. The big hand. One of the giants that David had to kill when he was older had a big hand. Greedy. It represents greed. It's mine. I want that. No, leave it for someone. That could be the last one. No, that's mine. It belongs to me. It's my dog. It's my truck. It's my ball. It's my piece of cake. It's my last piece of pizza. It's mine. Right. No, it's not. Amen. No, it's not. It's called greed. Stages of a dream. I thought it. God inspired. Listen, all the people have dreams, but they're not inspired by God. Yeah. The people in the book of Genesis had a dream of building the Tower of Babel. That's right. It wasn't God's dream. Amen. That's true. And a lot of people have dreams, but it's not God inspired. You know when it's God inspired. You'll know when God drops it in your heart that this is your assignment. This is what He wants you to do. Praise the Lord. A dream is I thought it. A dream is I caught it. A theme is I bought it. A theme, a, a vision is I sought it. I got it. Go through that again, Pastor. I thought it. I caught it. I bought it. I sought it. I got it. Ask people, what's your dream? And they look at you like you've got three heads. Robert Kennedy, going back to the days of my youth, said these words. Some men see things as they are and say, why? I see things as they are and say, why not? Amen. I read a story about a great baseball pitcher by the name of Don Drysdale yesterday. I was by no stretch of the imagination a baseball Dodger fan, because I was a giant fan. But Don Drysdale was one of the greatest pitchers that ever lived. He could throw a fastball that looked like an aspirin as it was coming to the catcher's men. And in those days when they had the brush back fastballs, he threw at your head. You got out of the way. But I read a story about Don Drysdale yesterday. He so loved Robert Kennedy. 
that for the rest of his life, he walked around with a cassette tape of Robert Kennedy's last speech before he got assassinated. He walked around with a cassette tape the rest of his life in his pocket every day. Why? Perhaps he was inspired. So many things see things as they are and say why, and I see things as they are and say why not. If I'm not mistaken, I have to look it up. Don Drive, there was the only baseball pitcher that ever threw six shutouts in a row. I believe that's a, a record. I have to look it up to clarify, but I believe he's the only pitcher in baseball that threw six shutouts. Nine inning game. That's when pitchers went the distance and did complete games. Nowadays, if someone goes five innings and gives up three runs, they say he did a great job. <laughs> what a joke. Spiritual vision leads to inspiration. Spiritual vision leads to faith. Spiritual vision leads to prayer. Spiritual vision leads to accomplishment. Spiritual vision leads to fulfillment, to, to satisfaction. Spiritual vision leads to God's will, and then it leads to God's joy. You know that you know that you know in God's will when you have the joy of the Lord in your soul and you're doing what God is telling you to do. Amen. Does that mean we're all going to be preachers, prophets? No, be the best father you can be. Be the best husband you can be. Be the best best wife or mom you can be. Be the best kid you can be. Be the best church member you can be. Be the best preacher you can be. That's what it means. God will give you a vision for your life, what he wants you to accomplish, how he wants to touch you. But sometimes we need a crisis because a crisis is a wake-up call. And if you look at the life of Isaiah, it produced a vision in the life, excuse me, in the life of Saul. A God-given vision will strengthen us. In Acts 26, 12, he says, Saul, whereas I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining right about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Here's vision. Here's a God-given dream. Here's a God-given direction. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Saul was a murderer. Blasphemy. He was a bad man. He was a bad man. He went into Christians' homes and he pulled people out, had them incarcerated, and eventually many of them died. And we say, why would God want to save a guy like that? Because God saves sinners. Amen. He didn't come from goody two shoes. He came for sinners. He came for us that needed a physician. Our sins would be taken away. And people stand in awe sometimes that God would do this to such a bad man. And then create him into Paul the Apostle to write two thirds of the New Testament. Boy, God is strange sometimes, isn't he? God's mysterious sometimes, isn't he? Who can know his ways? Who can know his plans? But he does say this. He says, I have plans for you. I have plans for your future. 
That sounds like vision. I have thoughts, good thoughts for you. That sounds like vision. Amen. That sounds like God wants to do something in our lives, no matter what age you are. Amen. He spoke to the child Samuel. He spoke to young Timothy. And he wants to speak to us, no matter how old or young we are. Listen, how can you possibly not have vision and godly direction when you look at what Paul the Apostle eventually went through. Let me read his resume. 2 Corinthians 11.23 Paul said, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I'm more. In labor is more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths often. Of the Jews five times I received forty stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journey and often, in perils of war, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. How can you possibly endure all that if you do not have godly vision and godly direction? Amen. I declare, Paul the Apostle turned out to be a great man of God. Amen. You don't hear a complaint. You don't hear a murmur. You don't hear this or that. All you hear is testimony unto Christ. Because he knew who he believed. He was regenerated. He had a vision of Christ. The Lord took him to the third heaven. He said, I saw things I can't even speak of. Think of that. You can't come through all these difficulties without a vision. And you will not be able to go through all the difficulties you're going to experience in the future without vision. <laughs> Mark it down on your book. Many will crumble. That's right. Many will cave. They'll fold up their tent and they'll go home. Some of the big talkers will have no voice. They'll succumb to the darkness. When God stops us, like he did Saul, he will allow us to look at ourselves properly and honestly. We will see our position. You need to see position this morning. What's your position? Where are you in Christ? Where are you, where are you in the vision? Where are you in godly direction? Are you being motivated by God? Are you being led by the spirit of God? Or the spirit of self, which is an enemy of God? It's death. And what people are doing is they're just bringing death to them. Instead of life. For me in my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. This could be dangerous as it will reveal to us what we are and what we're not. When we examine ourselves, when we look at ourselves and we see position, position will reveal to us what we are and what we're accomplishing. It might tell us I'm not being what I want to become in Christ. Listen. I don't know people's hearts. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. I don't live with you day in and day out. You don't live with me day in and day out. I don't know your walk with the Lord. I'm just a preacher. I'm a pastor. I'm not a shepherd or watcher. I sound the alarm when I think it should be sounded. I blow the trumpet when I believe it needs to be born. But another day is here that we have to become honest with God. Amen. And we have to examine our hearts. Are we loving? Are we forgiving? Do we have compassion? Are we doing what the Bible says? That's godly vision. That's godly direction. When we follow the rules, 
And we follow what thus saith the Lord. We're walking in that anointing. We're walking in that vision. Isaiah needed a wake-up call to find vision and purpose for his life. Because Uzziah the king, Uncle Uzi, he can go to the palace and eat the best foods. Had everything he wanted. Probably the shiniest chariot. But something happened. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, uh-oh, gravy train is gone. How long will the gravy train remain in America? How long will the good life remain in America? You don't know, I don't know. God warned the prophet Habakkuk that the Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are coming, the people aren't listening. Destruction to Jerusalem and Judah. People don't want to hear that. It can be changed if America repents. It could be changed if God wakes up a sleeping giant called a church. Right. Instead of us people playing games with God, thinking I came to church for two hours on Sunday, I have fulfilled my religious obligation. If that's your vision of Christianity, you are lost. If that's your vision of Christianity, you are lost. Because that's not what the Bible says in Proverbs 29. When you get a revelation of Jesus, it's an everyday experience. Mm -hmm. And we should not think we're doing God a favor because we come here every week for two hours. No. No, there come a day perhaps when the door of this church might have to be open 24-7. When there'll be all night prayer meetings because people will be crying and howling and wailing before the Lord saying, why God? Just like Habakkuk did. We'll voice our complaints unto God and we'll say, God, why? Right. And God will have an answer. He'll have one. Perhaps not one that we like. He said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with, with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then said I, Here I am, send me. What happened to Isaiah? Dark time. Dark time. Came to him personally. His good friend, the king, died. Wasn't expecting. That's right. Son. Life changed. You want to know something, folks? Life can change in the moment of a twinkle of an eye. Yeah. Just like that. God gave him vision. You see, when God stops us like he did Saul of Tarsus, when he stops us like he did Isaiah the prophet, when he stops us from running to and fro, when he stops us from that restless spirit, that has invaded America and the American church. When he stops us, we will see our potential. Five things happened to the prophet Isaiah. Number one, he saw God, but he saw a holy God. Man, have we lost that in the church world. 
Have we lost the thought of holiness before God? Have we lost the thought of modesty before the Lord? To think that we'll stand face to face with God one day. We've lost the sense of holiness in the church. Pentecostal churches were known as holiness churches. Pentecostal holiness. Sons of God, Church of God, Nazarene Church, Nazarites. It was a holiness movement. The Wesleyan Church was a holiness movement. Holy before God. A respect and an awe for the Creator. Isaiah saw a holy God. But then he saw himself. You know, a lot of people don't want to see themselves. We want to put up the mass and the defense mechanisms. We make fun of the people now that are wearing masks, and I'm not a mask person. What about the masks we wear? You see, they make fun of us, and they call us hypocrites. Because they say, I do the same thing you do, but you just go to church. You talk just like me. You just go to church. You see, the world has invaded the church. The world has invaded our homes. The world has invaded our children. Foreigners have come on our soil through iPads. Pedophiles. Right. Chat rooms. TikTok. They're already here. Inhabiting our children. And parents have no clue what's even going on. Who they're talking to. And what they're doing. And what they're listening to. Think about that for a moment. You know, I found some old lyrics that I handed out to church people 25 plus years ago about rock music. I had to laugh. I was looking at my files and I found these old songs, brother. And we thought that was, wow, what are these kids listening to? This stuff is bad. Bad. Not compared to what kids are listening to today. <laughs> I, was, I said, what? This, I used to warn parents. I said, because parents would come to me and say, you know, my, my kid's turning a teenager and he's changed. I said, oh, I can tell you why. What, Pastor? I said, for the most part, he's probably listening to secular music. And he's filling his head with junk. You know how many Christian people still listen to country music? Yep. I left Betty Sue at the bar. She broke my heart. Secular stations. Think about it. How many Christians read their own horoscopes? It's true. Pay for mediums. Evil spirits. To predict their future. Go to palm readers. How many curves do you have in your hand? Reading tea leaves at the bottom of your teacup. Really. And that's what people believe. We've been invaded. That's right. And we don't even know it. Because the enemy rarely comes through the front door. He always comes through the back door. He saw himself, but then he saw others. He allowed God to change him. Isaiah began to reach out to God and say, okay, allow me to become what you want me to become. Not what your wife wants you to become. Not what your husband wants you to become. Not what your parent wants you to become. It's natural. People want to change people. But they got some mysterious power. Ain't going to change nothing. It's like talking to the wall. It's like until you're blue in the face, all your talk amounts to a hill of beans and even less. Unless a person has a vision for regeneration in their heart, a revelation of Christ. Then the door is open. Until then, there's rebellion. There's arguments. There's schisms. There's divisions. 
And that's the work of satanic forces that have invaded our marriages, our homes, our children, our churches. That's why there's splits. It's called the Absalom spirit. You will be willing to let go and be willing to pay the price for what God wants to accomplish through you when you have an experience like Isaiah or like Saul or when you're born again. You see, the born again experience has been watered down into easy believism, cheap grace. Add Jesus to your vocabulary and just keep doing what you're doing. You're a Christian. You're going to heaven. No. Got to quit smoking dope. Got to put a cork on the bottle. Amen. Hmm. No one will say amen at the same time. Amen. How are we justify? God knows my heart. Yes, he does. And the prophet said it's deceitful and basically wicked above all things. Yes, God knows my heart. When it's not right. There's three parts to a godly vision. First is a divine intervention. That's the beginning when God comes and speaks to us. Then there's divine assistance. It's the process that we go through for the rest of our life that God is processing us to become more like the image of Christ. And there's the divine destiny, the outcome, the result of vision, the result of your assignment. God's vision will strengthen us. God-given vision will challenge us and stretch us. Listen, I want to stop there for a moment. Did you ever have a sports coach that stretched you? Yeah. Well, you got mad at him. Yeah. You ever have a teacher that stretched you? Yeah. Because she saw the potential. And you didn't want to do it. She made you do it. Because in those days, you listened. <laughs> you didn't whine. No. I can't do it. I don't like it. It's not fair. Oh, really? You see the problem in America? You know why there's all those wanted signs out there in Auburn, wanted to hire? Because we haven't stretched our children. We've allowed them to become entitled. You know why kids can't read? You know why kids go to college and we have to give them intermediate courses so they can learn how to read? Because we've dumbed them down. Yeah. And we haven't challenged them. And said, no. We can learn this. We can do this. We can stretch. We can challenge. And when you stop crying, we're still going to do math. Amen. And when you stop crying, we're still going to go through the spelling words. And when you stop crying, you're still going to get a test. And I'm going to mark your test. And I'm going to let you know what your position is. Amen. See, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Finding out where we are. I took tests all my life. I had to take tests all my life in school. And I went through a lot of schools and a lot of tests. Did I always like it? No. Did I always take a course that I liked? No. I had a French teacher that came in the first day and said, this is the last day you'll hear me speak English. Oh, I panicked in graduate school. <laughs> this is the last day you'll hear me speak English. Whoa, what's this guy talking about? I'm going to learn French? Yeah, I'm going to learn French. I learned Italian in high school. The book, Giovanni Passaguay. <laughs> Did I like it? I needed a half a credit to graduate. I had to take a typing class. The only guy in a typing class full of girls. And so when they started typing, it was like, and here I am. I need this half a credit, teacher. I will not be able to graduate high school. These girls, she said, go, testing them. How many words per minute? It was like an assembly line. I had to do extra work and I had to go home, my mother's typewriter, and I had to type extra, 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 and bring it into her to get one stinking half credit so I could graduate from high school. 
Can I go home to my mommy and say, oh, that teacher's not fair. I don't like it. Could you do something? No. No. Never got that kind of love. I never got that kind of love. When I got beat up, when I lost a fight in Brooklyn, and they brought me home and threw me on the front porch, my mother said, it's your own fault. You put the three-letter word and it starts with a D. It's my mother. I just got beat up. No love. Ma Barker was talking. Go fight. <clears throat> Where's the love of a mother? There was none. Not in that moment. Because she taught me to grow up tough. Instead of being a crybaby and a whiner, complainer. I don't like it. Never did that to my dad. Woo! Never happened. Never disrespected my mother or talked back to her. Never. Did what I was told. Let me finish. <clears throat> Examine where you are right now. Exchange little pleasures for the big victory. Exchange short-term satisfaction for long-term gain. Expose yourself to people with like vision. Get away from negativity. Get away from people that add nothing to your life spiritually. It's just talk, talk, talk. Right. Monday worldly talk. No iron sharpening iron. Just a bunch of blah, 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 willy bobo stuff. Nonsense. Who cares? Amen. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Are your family ready? Is your kids ready? How's your marriage? How's your home? Can you get some help? Express your belief in your vision or dream. Write it down. Talk about it. Explore every avenue. Every Expect opposition. Oh, Lord, expect opposition. Once you embark on a course that God has put you on, man, I'm telling you, the parade will start. And they'll rain on your parade. Lord, have mercy. I've had that all my life in the ministry. You can't do that. You can't do that. I shut up. <laughs> You're not my boss. Go rain on someone else's parade. Don't rain on mine. I got a big umbrella. That's God's umbrella. That's right. Because I don't need your raindrops. Amen. Praise the Lord. Expect opposition. Exercise all your energy and effort and your vision for God. Extract the positive. Exclude negative thinkers as close friends. <laughs> Negativity. Man. People, places, and things. Goodbye. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? Oh, no, I should just sit there and listen to your nonsense. So I go home depressed. No, not happening. It's crazy stuff. It's too late for that. I've come too far for that. Praise the Lord. I need excitement. I need vision. I need for you to tell me what's God doing in your life spiritually. What's the last verse that God gave you that you can expound on? Mm -hmm. Exceed by going beyond the average or normal energy. I learned that in graduate school. I was in the library all the time. My friend said, don't you want to go to a party? I said, no, no I got to study. Study? You always study. You always, what, what's wrong with you? I said, listen, you, you do your life by the morning. I want to pass. I want good grades. I don't want to just get by. It's not me. You got to put in a work. You got to put in a little extra. Mm -hmm. Then when I got my test back and I aced it, they would ask me, "What'd you get?" I said, "It's none of your business." Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, none of your business. Why do you care? When you put the work in, you get results. Right. I said, "When you put the work in, you get results. Mm -hmm. When you pay attention, you get results. Exhibit a confident attitude." Extend a helping hand. Teamwork by climbing together. Help others reach their dream. Help others see their vision. Help others see their gifts. My wife just did vacation Bible school about talents. Talents. What are your talents? How are you using your talents? That's what God gives us talents for. Because if we don't use them, He gives them to other people. If you really get to know Jesus, you'll stand on the rock. If you really get to know Jesus, you'll have roots. And if you really get to know Jesus, he will give you a vision. If you really get to know
know Jesus, you will know who you are. I really get a kick out of this world of people with identity crisis. I hear people say, I gotta go find myself. How does a lost person go find themselves? Amen. Where, where are you hiding? In the jungle or in the, in the woods? Where, where? Where are you? In your grandma's basement? Where are you hiding? I gotta go find myself. I gotta look inward. Inward? What's in there? Stomach? Liver? Kidneys? Whoa, whoa, what do you gotta look inward? What's inward? yourself, Amen. something greater than you, yes. to tell you, to instruct you, to direct you in the path that you should walk. Amen. That pastor in that island, the Lord spoke to him, and he said, go left. He would have died if he didn't hear the voice of the Lord. It's so critical in dark times to have vision and to hear the voice of God. God's vision is fresh, it's dynamic, it's anointed, it's pulsating. True vision does not look at the past. I want to tell you who brings you back to your past is Satan. That's right. He'll bring you back there every day. He'll remind you what you did 20 years ago. Out of the clear blue, it'll pop up. To tell you what a bad person you are, even though you're regenerated in Christ. The vision doesn't look at what we have already accomplished, though. The vision is present. It proceeds from God today at this very hour. This vision produces future results and fruits born of God. I have just a few moments. And you'll receive this in a handout to follow me that I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes. When I was a chaplain in the drug treatment program at Willard, we taught our clients the five steps of decision making. I took the five steps of decision making and I turned it into five steps to spiritual decision making. Because you know what I've seen as a pastor for all these years? I've seen people make decisions that turned out not to be God's will. Even after they received counseling from his word, they did it their way anyway. You've always heard me preach. When we stray from God and don't do what he originally asked us to do, he will bring us back to the foot of the mountain where we started and we start all over again to learn the lesson that he wanted to teach us perhaps many years ago. People say, well, I don't know about that. Well, go in the Old Testament and look at the Jewish people. He'll bring you back to the foot of the mountain where you left, where he spoke to you. I said, don't. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't decide that. Get counsel. And people, even after they receive counsel, they do their thing. And then they wonder why they're miserable. They wonder why they're just lost in life. Number one, see the situation clearly and spiritually. See, we have to have vision in the dark. There's more than meets the eye. Look beneath, look beyond, identify the powers and the principalities that are, that are at work. Number two, know what you want is the same thing that God wants. What does God want? What is God saying? What does the Bible have to say about the situation? And I give verses for this. I don't have the time to read them. So one, see the situation clearly, but see it spiritually. Know what you want is the same thing that God wants. Number three, expand your possibilities. That's what a lot of people never do. That's right. What are your spiritual options? Spiritually brainstorm with other Christians, their safety in a multitude of counselors, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything shall be established. That's what people don't do. They do it on their own. They don't brainstorm with other Christians. And ask other people, what do you think? Because you know why? We're afraid. We're afraid to have people say, well, maybe this is an alternative. Because we want to be right. 
Number four, evaluate and decide spiritually. Are the circumstances right? Is it biblical? What chapter and verse of the Bible are you utilizing? This is where people fail when I ask them as a pastor. Tell me the chapter and the verse that's telling you to do what you're doing or what you're going to be doing. Show me in the Word. I'll sit down and listen to you. I'll spend all afternoon with you. I'll buy you lunch. Convince me. What chapter and verse of the Bible are you utilizing? Do you have peace in your heart? This is a very important question. The circumstance might be right. You may even have chapter and verse to support your decision. But if you don't have peace in your heart, it is probably not the right decision at this time. Your heart is the umpire that helps you to decide. That's where people lose it. They say, Pastor, look at this. Look at this job. This is it, man. This, this, this is what I dreamed of. Then I ask them this question. Do you have peace in your heart about that? Then they hesitate. See, I know right there. See, I've, I've been in this too long. I've been in this too long. I'm not a novice. I say, everything is lining up wonderfully. Money, job, blah, blah, blah. But do you have peace in making this decision? And when they hesitate, just like a quarterback hesitates for a split second, and you get sad. Eventually, you'll get sad. Listen to me. I'm telling you the truth this morning. I don't, I don't come here to play games. No. We're going to go through darkness, but we don't have to lose our vision. We don't have to lose our sight. Once you figure out that you have the peace of God about what God wants you to do, act with faith. Act with action and not procrastination. You see, when I see people hesitate, well, I don't know. That's double-mindedness. It's the Bible. You discern that really quickly. Well, I should, I shouldn't, I should, I shouldn't. I go back and forth like a tennis ball in a tennis match because you don't have peace. Amen. And when you don't know what to do, pray. Wow, what a novelty. When you don't know what to do, pray. Now, think about that. So simplistic. Let me finish. Vision no matter what happens. Now this is what Habakkuk wrote in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. You see, he knew darkness was coming. He knew foreign soldiers, Babylonians, were coming to plunder Jerusalem and Judah. He knew it. But here's his stand before God. Even though the fig tree has no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty. What was he saying? He said, I will still serve the Lord. Amen. And I will rejoice in the Lord my God. You know what he was saying? I will not lose vision of the great king. Amen. I will not lose vision of eternity. I will not lose vision of what God is doing in my life. But I will rejoice. And if you read in that same chapter, it says, and God will give me rest. In closing with these two verses, Exodus 33, 14, famous verse, Moses, he said unto Moses, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. The last part of Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 17 says this. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. I believe there will come a day when there will be a darkness on America, when I don't know. I don't pray for it. But how can we possibly escape when cities like Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York City are being plundered by gangs, violence, and criminals? And in certain states, I saw this morning that we're letting prisoners out. No cash bail. You could have theft. You can even hurt someone. 
and we're not going to be arrested and put in prison. One offense after the other that people are already going to bother you. So when you see someone in Auburn going through a store with a big shopping bag, and they put a lot of goods from a shelf in their bag, and they walk out, don't be alarmed. Because no one's going to stop them. You can't touch them. And that's why you're paying at least 15% more for every item in your store because of theft. I went to Dunkin' Donuts on Seymour Street, State Street, the other day. I know the kid there. I said, how come you're closing? He said, we're closing for about four weeks. I said, why? He said, we're going to push this counter out to the second window. And I said, you're going to have tables? He said, I hope not. I said, why is that? Theft, riffraff, troublemakers. You see, we have to pay the price that I can't go to Dunkin' Donuts and get myself something to eat and a cup of coffee and sit there and watch the world go by for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's possibly going to be taken away. No tables. I said, you're serious? He said, it's probably going to happen. Why? Theft. So what theft? Right next door. There's that store. Yeah. Go in, open the refrigerator, take what you want, go to Dunkin' Donuts, <coughs> sit down there, eat, drink, and then leave and not pay. And you have to pay the price for a cup of coffee. For a cup of coffee. And for a donut. Because of what they're doing. People are living in La La Land thinking, it's always going to be good. I hope it is for you and for me and for our grandchildren. But in the meantime, let's keep our vision so that we can walk in the dark. If we have to go through that, even in our towns, in Jesus' name, let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the admonition. Thank you, Father, that you see what's going on. And only you can heal and deliver. And I pray, God, for your protection upon this church. I pray for your protection upon our families, our homes, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. I pray, God, that you draw a circle, as our pastor used to teach, a circle of blood around us, God, in the mighty name of Jesus, to watch over the instruments that you have brought into this world, that, God, we may prosper in you, and shine your light and be the salt of the earth, keeping vision even during a dark time in our country. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Would you stand with us for a moment?